picking uh, picking back up where we left off. Um, we're we're at the the really fun part of the Bible. All right, so we've been through the whole uh, creation narrative, right? Um, some stuff that we want to highlight, kind of as we review what we've read, is that whole waters above the chaos. Remember the chaos waters? Remember like the tohu vavohu state of creation before God spoke to the waters and brought order out of chaos, right? And then on, on day two, what he did was he separated the waters below and the waters above. Remember that? And he, he, the, the Hebrew word was vault. He made a vault in the heavens to hold back the waters, okay? That's going to be pretty important to remember, right? And then God creates everything. He sees everything, says, hey, this is good, right? He sees it, so it's good. And then, um, and then we have Adam and Eve in the garden and the whole uh, Garden of Eden narrative, which, by the way, if y'all, if y'all haven't seen it, um, the Bible Project just put out a fantastic video on the Garden of Eden. So uh, I don't know if y'all have seen it or not, but it's amazing. And uh, I've already watched it like three times because I'm a nerd. Um, yeah, anyway, um, I'm on their email list, so I get like email updates. <laughs> like, hey, it's launching in five minutes. So I'm like, oh boy. Anyway, um, I need hobbies. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, so Genesis chapter three is the fall, right? Where Adam and Eve rebel. They decide, hey, I know what's good in my own eyes, so I'm going to do it. And then we see what happens to their, their family and their children afterwards, right? Genesis chapter 4 is just mankind descending into chaos. We get a brief reprieve with Genesis chapter 5, and we see some godliness happening, right? And then we crash right into uh, Genesis chapter 6, which is what we covered last week, which was all about how things were so bad that God was shocked. Y'all remember that part? With a little bit thrown in about giants, maybe? Who knows? Um... And the Nephilim, which I'm still shocked y'all didn't have as many questions as I thought. So I'm just going to say I did a good job explaining it. We'll go with that. Yeah. Um, and if you're new here, um, these are posted on YouTube, and you can watch them from the comfort of your home. But uh, So we left off at Genesis 6, um, verse 9, if I remember that correctly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Before before we jump in, uh, I put it on this slide for a reason, and I almost forgot that it was there. Um, <clears throat> this uh, this is the parallel chart that I really wanted us to to wrap our heads around of Adam and Noah. And uh, if you have the printout notes, it's like page forty seven. And then if you have the note taking printout notes, uh, good luck. I don't remember. Sixties uh, maybe. Um, what do you have it? Oh, page 61. Look at that. I'm smarter than I thought I was. All right. Praise God. All right. Um, but this is, this is really important to wrap our heads around, is uh, that narratively speaking, we're supposed to be looking at Noah with anticipation, right? We're supposed to look at Noah with hope for him being the seed of the woman that will crush the head of the serpent, right? He's our big hope. He's our big like, uh, he's, he's looked to as possibly the hero of the story, the guy that's going to set everything right. Does that make sense? Because not only in the narrative are we in desperate need of that, but also he's the tenth from Adam through Seth. So that means he's of that godly line that we looked at a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago. And the ten, number ten, remember, means completion, right? So we're like, oh, this, this thing's complete now. So that means, boom. We're done, right? That's, that's narratively where we're supposed to be uh, in, the, in a state of expectation. Yeah? Cool? All right. Um, Y'all can read that chart for yourself. We talked about it a little bit last week. All right, verse 9. Here we go. <clears throat> what happened? Fun. Okay. If we... Click the mouse. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. It'll be fine. We'll figure it out. Um, 
All right, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the records of the generation of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. All right, that's not very hopeful at all, right? So uh, a couple things that jump out to us, right, is one, we need to remember that Noah's name means rest or comfort, okay? So in Genesis 5, 29, when we're first introduced to Noah, uh, his father calls him Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground, which the Lord has cursed. So that just adds on to this whole narrative expectation. That he's going to be the one to set everything right. So, um, Noah, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, the writer of Hebrews, whoever that may be, Paul probably, um, says that Noah, the comfort that Noah brought wasn't necessarily to himself or to the world around him, but a comfort to God, and that God could look upon the earth and see that there was Noah. Remember that everything is awful but Noah, and if that but wasn't there, our but wouldn't be here. Remember that awesome joke that I told you that y'all all laughed at a lot? Yeah, yeah. okay. <clears throat> so that's... Uh, the way that the Bible interprets Noah's role in this story is, is the hope bringer, right? I can't overstate this enough of where we're supposed to be emotionally going into the story, okay? We also see that the whole earth, and remember in that mindset, it's not globe. Remember, we're, we're tourists in a foreign country. It's not globe, it's land, was failing and corrupt. Like everything is broken. The ground itself just seems to be just as corrupt and broken and messed up as the heart of mankind at this point, right? Um, if, you look, <clears throat> if you look at the verses we just read, uh, verse 11 says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, right? And mentions sight of God there, and then in verse 12 it says, God looked on the earth, Right? Those two phrases are, are there on purpose. It's meant to evoke or help you remember the Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where God looked, God saw that it was good. Do you remember that? So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to have like this point-counterpoint image pop up in our minds to where we say, hey, God's looking at something and it's not good anymore. You tracking? Okay, so that's just to emphasize how far we have fallen as a species and that there's only one person on the entire earth that gives us any hope, right? So it says also that the world was full of corruption and chaos and violence. So the inhabitants of the world had become just as wild and waste as the land was before God created Eden, right? Remember the whole tohu vavohu in Genesis 1, 2. So what is the difference between that state, Genesis 1, 2, before God started bringing order into the world, and where mankind is now? According to the narrative, nothing. Right? So the world is in a state as if God had never done anything. We have undid, undone, there we go, undid, we undid, all the work, I'm educated, I swear. Ugh. I'm going to have some coffee after that one. We have undone all the work that God has done up to this point, right? But Noah, again, but Noah stands as a stark counterpoint to the rest of the world. And his, its corruption makes his godliness shine out the brighter. Yeah? So, um... Noah, this is the mention of Noah's three sons, which, if you remember that chart that we just showed, is a parallel with Adam. Adam had three sons. Noah has three sons, right? A little bit of foreshadowing there. We'll get to that part, right? So Noah's three sons have um, been interpreted in the past along racial lines, which we shall see when we get to that part is a little bit problematic. Um, but it's interesting to note that in this part of the world, this, isn't, this is just a fun little side note here. 
But in this part of the world, at this time, right, in the ancient Near East, there were three main linguistic groups, right? Which I thought was super duper interesting, right? So you have like the African languages, and then you have the uh, Indo-European languages in the north, right? And then you have the uh, Semitic languages that are kind of in the east. And those are the three main linguistic families in this area of the world at the time. And I just thought it was really interesting that those are the three dominant linguistic families, and then Noah is said to have three sons. And of course, there's always an outlier ruining it, like Sumerian, which doesn't fit in any category, but that's a bunch of language nerd stuff that you won't care about. Um, in Genesis chapter 10, when we get to the Table of Nations, it expands on the descendants of the three sons, and it's interesting to note that those three sons and their descendants correlate to these linguistic families, like pretty well. So, I don't know. I thought that was cool. I'm a big language nerd, so uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. I think the Bible puts it there on purpose. Um, <clears throat> any questions so far? Nope, still in the depressing part of the Bible. We'll see if we get to a happy part. All right. Then God said to Noah, hey, that's good. The end of all flesh has come before me. That's not good. Never mind. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. Now we get to some fun parts. Ready? Buckle up. This is like thrilling, thrilling part of the Bible, okay? This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life. From under the heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, and you, your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, and every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind, will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Right? So that's, that's like a really fun part of the Bible, right? Yeah? That's the part I read my kids at night when I want them to go to bed. Um, there's actually a lot of fun stuff in here, um, and, and we'll get to it, uh, which, I mean, I think it's fun. It means it probably won't be fun for everyone else. But, um, okay, so the phrase, the end of all flesh has come before me. That's pretty curious, right? So, um, there's two possible ways to interpret this, and I just kind of would want to pose the question to you for you to ponder on your own. But does this mean that this is the end? Like, as in, this is as, life, as bad as life can get. The state that mankind was in by Genesis chapter 6 was as corrupt and as horrible as life could possibly get. Or, does this mean that God can see the direction that humanity is trending, and before it gets there, He wants to go ahead and end it? See that? pretty interesting thing to think about. And the way you interpret that verse says a lot about how you kind of think about God's character and how he handles problems. I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way. It's just there's more than one way to kind of look at the verse. I know I always looked at it as this is as bad as life can get. But it could, could mean, very well possibly could mean, that God sees the direction it's headed, and he's just like, nah, we're just going to stop it now. Because if we keep heading down that road, the cost will be too great. Yeah? Okay, so um, 
Remember how this whole thing's called a tour through Genesis? Remember how we called it that? Um, I want to talk about a moment of bad tourism. Okay, so we haven't done one of these in a while. So I know you're all really excited. So have you heard of the word cravat? Have you heard that word before? Right? It's like, um, it, I know in German and Czech, the way that you say necktie is cravata. Okay? And it comes from the same word, cravat. Right? So um, this word actually comes out of French. Cravat, right? Now the French word actually came about because there were some Croatian mercenaries running around France at one of their multiple wars during the 18th century, right? And so the Croatians are known for having this pattern called the checky, right? And it's, the, it's basically a picnic blanket, right? It's, it's red and white checks. If you've seen like their national soccer team jerseys, they look like they're wearing picnic blankets, but it's like they're really proud of it, you know? So the Croatian mercenaries to, the, to kind of signify and stand out would wear these neck ties, like this a neckerchief or whatever, with this pattern on it, right? Now, the, the Croatian word for a Croatian is hravat, right? With a hard H, hravat. And so after all the Frenchies saw the Croatians wearing this stylish necktie, they were like, what do we call this thing? So they called it a kravat after the hravat. Does that make sense? And so these words, right? can come back into languages and be so weird. And now, now it's gone like full circle. And now the Croatian word for necktie is cravata. So it starts with their name for themselves, cycles through French and German, and then back into Croatian. Isn't that crazy how words can just take these crazy, like, I don't know, linguistics. It, it just wigs me out. I think it's fun, right? So bad tourism is not understanding words right? Not understand what you're saying. It's kind of like the same way that, um, that, you know how llamas got their name? Like the animal llamas? Okay, so what is llama in Spanish? Name, right? So you have conquistadors walking around the Andes seeing these weird looking camel giraffe things and they're like, hey, como se llama? What is that called? And the Quechua people, the Indians, you know, when you don't understand somebody, you usually repeat the last word they said. So the Quechua are like, Yama. And they're like, Como se llama? Yama? And so they're like, oh, they're called Yama. <laughs> you see that? Como se llama? Yama? Yama. Yama. Llama. That's how we got the word for llama. It's one of the dumbest things in, in the world, right? You're welcome. You're now smarter for that, right? So these words like, can be interpreted in, in ways that aren't even intentional and, and sometimes mistakes. So some words like that appear here in verse 14. Okay, So verse 14 might be one of the hardest uh, verses to translate in the Old Testament. Okay, So what we do know is that the word gopher, rooms, and pitch aren't Hebrew. They're not Hebrew words. They're loan words that have been transliterated into Hebrew. Just like kravat comes from hravat and lama comes from yama. Does that make sense? Yeah? So um, we, to this day, have no idea what gopher wood is. Or if you want to make it sound, because gopher sounds really stupid, right? You'll hear like scholars not want to sound something that's, not want to say sound, something that sounds stupid. They'll be like, go fair. It's go fair. Just like my wife shops at Target, you know what I mean? Like Jacques Pinet, you know? Like this is, this is dumb. It's gopher wood, right? We to this day have no idea what gopher wood is. We don't know, right? Um, and for the longest time, we didn't know what rooms and we didn't know what pitch meant. These are isolate, language, isolate words from a lone language that we, we just don't have great attestation to. And it wasn't until like the 20th century when we started finding tons of cuneiform tablets in ancient Akkadian that we were able to make some inroads into understanding, right? So the closest word that we can find in Akkadian to this gopher word is a shepherd's hut. Does that make sense? Shepherd's hut, right? And then rooms where the uh, ancient translators of the Bible, one of the Bible translators translate this word as rooms, we actually think it's the Akkadian word reeds. Reeds, right? And then 
Pitch was a great inference by the translators as they had no clue what it meant, but it means like bitumen or, or tar, right? What you would use to seal something and waterproof it. So the, the, the rooms slash reads word is a little bit confusing to us, but if you do a little bit of just archaeology and, and digging, you'll see that in the ancient Near East, in the um, area of Mesopotamia, especially in the southern part of Mesopotamia, and there's actually there's marshlands down in southern Iraq by where the Tigris and Euphrates drain into the Persian Gulf, right? There's a lot of marshlands, and they use um, the marsh Arabs is what they're called, use reeds, bundles of reeds, to make boats, right? And this has been a long-standing tradition. You can pretty much dig up a thousand-year-old reed boat, and it'll look almost exactly like what they're using today, okay? So the ancient reader, right, the intended audience of this story in Genesis would have understood exactly what they were saying, right? So uh, John Walton would tell you that a better translation of this verse is, make for yourself an ark of wood from shepherd's huts, and you shall make it with reeds, and you shall cover it inside and out with bitumen, right? So what does that add to the story? Not much. I just want to be honest. This is a part of the Bible we're kind of unclear on, right? And if we're making an ark that is as big as is described here, that's a lot of reeds, right? And that's a, a lot of shepherd's huts, right? So um, let's talk about the dimensions of the ark, right? Uh, the dimensions of the ark that are given are designed not to help you have like a mental image, but more to c communicate the meticulous care with which Noah practiced his obedience, right? Remember uh, a couple weeks ago, I told you about how Noah was such a key figure. Sorry. So not only does Noah have like a bazillion ways to relate to Adam, but he also has a lot of ways where he relates to Abraham and then later Moses. There's so many parallels that tie in and meet with Noah. And I, I think I have some of those charts coming up later, right? So what this is doing is it's setting up in your mind, creating a category for you to have an understanding of what a godly man does, right? If no one else on earth is walking with God, how do I know if someone is? It's the care with which they obey the commands of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, if the arc dimensions are converted into freedom units, we're looking at something that's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Like I said, that's a lot of reeds. That's a lot of deconstructed shepherd's huts. You know, a lot of angry shepherds. <laughs> Where's my hut? <laughs> I wonder if that's how it really happened. Uh, 120 years, yeah. 120 years of shepherds going, where the heck go? They build another one, then Noah sneaks over in the night, and he's like, ha, ha, and he takes them. <laughs> my, uh, my youngest son, uh, George, has gotten in the habit now of laughing like a, a villain from a cartoon. I don't know why it started, but he just started doing it. It's just like, uh, we were talking today, like, and he just goes like, I took Harold's toy. Ha, 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 ha. Like, just like that. I don't know how to handle this. <laughs> like, if he grows a mustache and starts twirling it, like, do I have to worry about things? Like, is he gonna, he's gonna tie a girl up and set her on train tracks or something? Like, you know? Anyway, that's totally... Okay, speaking of corruption, um, God says he's gonna send a flood of water, okay? So, flood of water. It says that God is gonna cover the face of the earth with water. When was the last time the face of the earth was covered with water? Right at the beginning, yeah. What was the state of the earth then? Tohu vavohu, wild and waste, chaos, right? So the way man is living is unsustainable, right? They're driving the world into chaos, so the Lord is handing them over to their desire to return to the state of total chaos. 
You see that? Like, um, I can't remember if we hit that point when the floodgates open. We probably do, but I'll, I'll just say it twice because it's really important. This kind of sets up a theme where the Lord hands you over to the thing that you want, right? And it's the thing that you want that ends up destroying you. Do you see that? So like we can go back to Adam and Eve in the garden. They wanted knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to decide what was right and wrong for themselves. So the Lord handed them over to that. And then they started deciding what was right and wrong for themselves and their kids end up killing each other. You see that? Because their right and wrong wasn't sufficient to sustain life like God's is. Okay? Here we have mankind obviously wanting chaos because that's how they're living. So God is like, I will hand you over to chaos. The last time we see chaos was when the, when the earth's face was covered with water. So God is handing them over. He's giving them what they want. But the thing that they want is going to be the very thing that destroys them. Right? A way that I think about this is like addiction. You ever think about that? Like how addiction is that thing that you want. You can't help yourself, but you end up being destroyed by the very thing that you want. It becomes your God. It becomes the thing that rules you and runs your life. So like that's the category we're talking about right now. Okay? Uh, in this little section here, uh, what are we? Verses 14, or 13 to 22 is the first time that we see a covenant mentioned as well. So this is a new category that we need to be creating in our mind as we read the Bible forward, right? So this is a law of first mention kind of thing. Does that make sense? So we need to, hey, okay, so next time we see a covenant mentioned, we need to remember when was the last covenant, right? When was that first covenant? What, what was talked about? What were the circumstances? So here's the covenant, right? The principle of the covenant, right, that God makes with Noah is to keep him alive, right? It's to preserve life. It's to keep the hope of redemption going in the story of humanity, right? So mankind's at its bleakest, darkest, worst point. We're so terrible that God said, hey, I really regret that this has ever happened, right? Maybe I should hit the reset button here. And God makes a covenant in that moment to preserve hope, to preserve life, to preserve the line of salvation. Do you see that? So what is the function of covenants in the Bible? It's that. It's nothing short of the redemption of the whole world. That's the whole goal of any covenant that God makes in the Bible. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And then, you know, this should have jumped right off the page, right? Um... How many, how many of each animal did Noah have to get? Two of each kind, right? Okay, when's another time that we see man and animal interacting? In the garden, right? Boom, look at that. Like, there's, a, there's an Adam and Noah parallel. That's what, like, that should have popped right off the page. Did, it, did that happen to anybody? Like, oh, I remember that. And that's when Adam was naming the animals, right? He's like, hey, look at this. This is a bass. And then here's another bass that has stripes. Striped bass, okay. I look at another bass, it's kind of rainbow. It's a rainbow bass or whatever. Rainbow trout? I don't know. I don't know fish. Y'all uh, tracking? Okay. And all of these parallels with Adam are supposed to kind of add up in your mind to this point where we begin to see the ark as a miniature Eden. Right? The ark is this place where all of the animals are living together in harmony. No one's eating each other. They're all being provided for, and they're all being protected from the chaos and death around them. Okay, and then verse 22. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Do you remember way back on like the first day we talked about that, that fun structure, chiasmus? You remember that? Hey, I found it again. Okay, so in the chias, uh, chiastic, there's the word, chiastic structure, what is the most important part? The middle. The middle. Okay, somebody just be brave and read the middle statement in verse 22. Yeah, 
There you go. So what does the author of Genesis want to emphasize? Yeah, obedience. Obedience. That's like the, the theme of Noah's life. What do we do? How do we know somebody's walking with God? They meticulously obey his commands. Right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll just go for it. All right. So, kind of thousand foot view here as the chapter wraps up, right? We open with life being described on earth as violent and chaotic, right? Um, the timeline is a little bit weird. It just says that when man began to multiply, the violence began to spread, right? So we can infer that this was a continual thing from Genesis chapter 4, right? And, and the hope for the seed of the woman that will crush the head of the snake is fading as we're painted a picture of heavenly and earthly rebellion trying to join forces to operate out of their own wisdom. And then we see how deeply hurt the Lord is. And then we come to Noah, who is painted as a new Adam. He's a man that is friends with animals, he's a farmer, and he's obedient to all that the Lord asks of him. So we, we should be asking, is Noah the snake crusher? Right? Now, the, the big elephant in the room right now is, is, was the flood local or global? Right? That's like the, the big question everybody wants to know. Um, and so much ink has been spilled with way more brilliant minds than myself for thousands of years about this going back and forth, right? And nobody can really land in a solid place, right? Um, so there's some, uh, there's some arguments back and forth. Do you all want to go over those? Talk about why some would say it's local and others would say it's a global flood? Yeah, yeah? okay. I don't want to get too much in the weeds here. So, I mean, like, because I can talk about this for a while. Um, I can even talk about, like, the Epic of Gilgamesh if you want to. You know, anyway, we'll probably get to that. Um, <laughs> some of y'all are like, who's Gilgamesh and why is he so epic? <laughs> Spoilers, he wasn't really. He was kind of selfish. He just wanted to live forever. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, somebody that said, like, somebody that would argue that the flood is local and not a global flood, right, would point to things like uh, these people... Uh, called the Kenites, right? The Kenites are mentioned in the Bible uh, in Judges 1.16. says that, the, uh, Ken- that uh, Moses' father-in-law was a Kenite. Uh, J.L. from Judges 4 and 5 was a Kenite. And Balaam prophesies over the Kenites in Numbers 24, 21 through 22. And they're like, why are you talking about these Kenites? Well, because this is kind of a sleight of hand by Bible translators, right? The Kenites are Cainites, descendants of Cain, the son of Adam, right? Um, so we see when the Kenites are described, they're described as herders and musicians or metal workers, which is exactly the three jobs that the sons of the descendants of Cain have for themselves. Remember those guys, J-Ball, Jubal, and Tubal Cain, right? So that begs the question, right? Um, and you can look at the Hebrew and see that it's it's Cain. Yeah. Anyway, Cainim, I think, is how they how they say it, right? Um, but the question is like, how did the Kenites survive the flood if it was a global flood, right? Well, uh, there's act- there was actually a rabbinical tradition, and if you've seen uh, what Aronofsky was that the guy that made the Noah movie? Y'all you know, remember the Russell Crowe Noah movie where it was all dark and gritty? It's like the Bible, but gritty, you know. Um, like uh, in that story, like in his script, he pulled a lot from these rabbinical traditions that aren't biblical, right? They're not canon, but they were tradition. Okay, and so one of those traditions was that Tubal Cain stowed away on the ark, right? And that's, that's how that line continued. Um, but then you run into all kinds of questions of like, how did he have kids? You know, did he steal someone's wife? What's going on here? Doesn't answer any questions, just creates more, right? Um, and so if the flood was global, the Kenites should not be mentioned later in Numbers and Judges, 
Yeah? Um, now, it's possible that the Kenites were um, associated with Cain just because of the trades that they were involved with, like shepherding and metallurgy. That is entirely possible. But that breaks with all of the naming convention that the book of Genesis uses. Right? The book of Genesis names your people after the forefather. Yeah? Okay? Cool. All right. So, um, also you can, if you read Balaam's words in Numbers, what was that, Numbers 24, you can see he says Cain. Like, he says Cain directly. Like, he names Cain as their father. So then you run into all kinds of problems. Does the Bible mean what it really means? You know, all that stuff. Anyway, we won't go down that road, right? Um, so that kind of makes me think that maybe the flood was just local, right? Um, but here's what we, I do know is that the flood narrative needs to be read in its context, in its cultural context, just like all the other passages in the Bible, right? So Old Testament and ancient Near East writers would tend to use hyperbole to express traumatic or catastrophic events, right? So, um, in Lamentations 2.22, it says, You called as in the day of an appointed feast my terrors on every side, and there was no one who escaped or survived in the day of the Lord's anger. Those whom I bore and reared, my enemy annihilated them. So, Jeremiah is writing about the fall of Jerusalem here. But if no one escaped, who wrote about the fall of Jerusalem? Right? Jeremiah is being expressive. He's using hyperbolic language to express the grief and loss that he feels. You see that? All right. Um, here, like the prophet Zephaniah says, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. This is a prophecy against Judah against Judah about his coming fall, right? We, we still have Jews. So this prophecy was clearly using hyperbolic language. Does that make sense? Okay. So maybe you're thinking, hey, these are examples of poetry and prophecy. So of course it's going to use hyperbolic languages, right? Well, in Genesis 41, hey, let's bring up another one. Genesis 41, 57. This is in the narrative of Joseph. Right? And Joseph's like the number two, number two in Egypt, right? And, and they stored up food for the seven years of feast and then there were seven years of famine. Remember that whole deal where he interpreted the dreams? You can go watch the, the movie or something if you want, right? Um, but it says, All the people of the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. Okay. So does that mean like a Viking like rode up the Nile in his longship? You know, you had like Maui, the Polynesian god, like coming in on his outrigging canoe, and then an Eskimo like floating in on an upside down igloo, like coming to Egypt and asking for food. No, it's clearly hyperbolic language, right? So the language does not always equal literal scope, right? But it does imply some kind of scope emotional traumatic scope. Yeah? yeah? Notably, all the cultures around the Hebrews, the Akkadians, Assyrians, Babylonians, even the Greeks had flood narratives in their history that predate any contact with the Bible. Right? So we do have some like flood narratives from Norse mythology, but they don't predate Christianity. Does that make sense? All of the ancient Near East religions all had a flood narrative in their respective culture and religion. So I think a flood did cover the world, but it's their world, and their world was contained within the Fertile Crescent in the ancient Near East. Does that make sense? They didn't have a concept of the Americans, Americas. They didn't have a concept of, of like, you know, the Scandinavian Peninsula. They didn't know about these things. So their world was covered by the flood. So to me, it makes a lot more sense if it's a local flood, but global from their perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. 
Now, to be fair, global flood proponents would come up with a couple very good arguments, right? One is we have seen geologic events accomplish in mere days the same effects that we would expect to take thousands or millions of years, right? Uh, a great example of this, I, I watched lectures by these people just to be fair, just so y'all know. Um, and I, I said that so derogatorily, I really didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> these people, oh Lord, forgive me. Um, like uh, a great example, I think the best example is Engineers Canyon outside of Mount St. Helens. That entire canyon was carved out in nine hours. Nine hours. And it looks almost the same to me as like Palo Duro Canyon, if you've been up there. Right? Just the angles and all of that wear and tear was done in just nine hours. So large amounts of time isn't necessarily needed. The flood could have been a recent event if it was sufficiently violent and catastrophic. Right? Uh, the New Testament authors, and this is arguing for the global perspective, New Testament authors seem to understand the flood to be a global event. That seems to be how they interpret it, right? Um, to me, one of the best objections is if God promised not to flood the earth anymore and the flood was only local, why do we still see local floods? That's solid logic. That's great logic, right? And if the flood was local, why did Noah not just move somewhere else? You had 120 years, right? Why not just, I'll just go that way for 120 years and then they could wind up in, you know, Turkey or whatever and be safe. See what I mean? So there's a lot of give and take here. For me, the local flood just makes more sense, but I'm not going to die on that hill. Does that make sense? There are very valid arguments for a global perspective on this thing. Um, I think there's just more for the, on the local side. You can run into all kinds of things like the water being above the mountaintops. That means it has to be like above Mount Everest or, you know, or did Mount Everest pop up like within the last seven or 8,000 years? You know what I mean? Um, there's all kinds of back and forth on validity, on whose argument is better or whatever. I land on this local their world side of things, which I feel is just a bit more solid, but I'm not going to like disparage anybody that thinks it's a global event, right? Because like I said, there's some very, very good arguments for that, right? But what we can say is there definitely was a catastrophic event, right? But the problem, like the Bible, like we, we've said often about Genesis, right? It just really doesn't care about our modern questions, Right? It just really doesn't care about our modern questions. Right? So the ancients weren't concerned about the mechanics and the minutia of the event. They were concerned about the meaning interpre and interpretation of the event. Right? So it wasn't, hey, did this flood cover everything, like literally everything, or just everything I could see? They didn't care about that. What they cared about is why did this flood happen and how do we stop it from happening again? Right? So the flood narrative is framed as a cataclysmic cosmic event, right? This, is, this flood happened because something was wrong both on earth and in heaven. Does that make sense? And the flood narrative, it works as a moment of recreation, right? So we have chaos waters covering everything again, then land reemerges, and then a garden or vineyard is replanted. Then God comes down and blesses them to be fruitful and multiply, right? So the knowing the animals thing, like, function as a reset of the Garden of Eden, right? And falls in line with the greater story and themes that the Bible are trying to tell. Bible is trying to tell. I can't talk today. Right? So, in short, the Bible, biblical authors viewed the flood as a cosmic cataclysmic event and not necessarily a geologic one. Right? So it was about not 
what were the mechanics of this, but what is the meaning of this? Yeah? Any questions so far? No, we're still having fun? Praise God. All right. So um, let me see real quick. If we talk about it. Nope. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and talk about it now. So um, one of the big arguments against the Bible is, is the flood narrative. Okay. This flood narrative is not unique to the Bible, like I mentioned. So there are three other ancient flood narratives. There's the Epic of Gilgamesh, there's the Atrahasis, and then there's the Eridu Genesis. This, I don't think I have any of this in notes, sorry. Um, this is like research I did after I had already printed these off, and they're like 70-something pages. I'm sorry, I just didn't want to do it again. Um, right? Um, so one of the big arguments against the Bible, and a, specifically the flood narrative, is that it was um, inserted or created during the Babylonian exile, right? So the idea is that the Jews were exiled in the Babylon. They were in encountering that culture, and the Babylonians are like, hey, where's your flood narrative, guys? You can't be a real religion around here if you don't have a flood narrative. And they're like, oh, dang, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we have one. It was a guy called no, uh, no, Noah, Noah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? And, and so they, like, borrowed from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, there's several problems with that. Um, mainly, it's that the key themes of the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Atrahasis, and the Eridu Genesis, is they don't line up with the themes of the Bible, right? They're communicating completely different things. So depending, I mean, the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh even disagrees with itself depending on what, like, tablet source you're using, right? One of them, Gilgamesh starts off on a quest to find immortality, right? And he comes across a guy that is immortal. And uh, the guy's, he's like, how did you become immortal? And he's like, oh, I ate a plant at the bottom of the sea. So Gilgamesh dives down there, grabs a, grabs a plant, and then the gods get mad and flood everything, right? Um, in other stories, he, uh, the gods get mad at humanity for keeping them awake at night. And so they flood the earth, right? Yeah, I mean... When my kids wake me up in the middle of the night, sometimes I'm tempted to flood the house. You know, just anything for people. No, I'm just kidding. That's terrible. Um, so um, so the, the themes in the Atrahasis, Epic of Gilgamesh, and the Eridu Genesis are more along the lines of um, God's vindictive punishment towards man, whereas the theme of this story, of the Noah flood, is God's redemptive pursuit of man. Do you see that? Right? The, the Gilgamesh epic and, and those other ancient Near East texts start with a man, Gilgamesh, wanting to make a name for himself, which is a theme that will come up later, right? Or, no, we already covered that with uh, the Giborim, right? The, the mighty men, the, the Nephilim, right? So Gilgamesh is thought of in those terms. Hey, there's that great point. Remember when I was talking about that, how the Bible was taking a pot shot at those other cultures, right? Gilgamesh is like one of the founding, founders of uh, Urdu. Urdu. Urdu? I'm asking y'all like y'all remember. Anyway, um, he's like one of their, their like patrons, right? Founding father. And, uh, and so he wanted to make a name for himself. He wanted to, to seek immor immortality, right? And in the process of that, he angers the gods, and then the gods punish, right? Whereas this story, the, the flood epic, the flood narrative of Genesis, starts with God's broken heart. Do you see that? And there's also all these other literary devices where we can, liter we can literally see <laughs> um, where the epic of Gilgamesh is stealing lines from the Atrahasis, Right? Like the, a good example is if you read Job, right? If you read the book of Job, it's very formalized, right? So like when somebody speaks, there's like a set phrase. It's like, and he opened his mouth to say to them, 
blah, right? Well, there's like set phrases like that in the Atrahasis and in the Epic of Gilgamesh where we can see there's, they just straight up borrowed those lines. Does that make sense? We don't see those lines appear in the story of the flood, right? Um, yeah, okay. Sorry, I was just trying to decide if I wanted to go down that rabbit trail. Um, I don't. The flood narrative of Genesis 6, uh, 6 through nine, 8, yeah, 6 through 8, is a lot shorter than the other narratives that we find in ancient Near East, Atrahasis, Eridu Genesis, and Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. Try and say that like three times fast. Um, our narrative, our flood story is shorter than all the other ones, right? And it doesn't stack up in the same way, even though it has parallel events, right? There are parallels that we draw. But what that says to me is that there was a cultural moment that everyone else was referring back to. And what we're seeing is that interpretation, the interpretation of that event through the culture and religion of those peoples. Does that make sense? So in the other ancient Near East cultures, it's very in keeping with their culture and religion to interpret the events like they did. Like Gilgamesh was trying to attain immortality and the jealous and vindictive gods punished him for trying to make a name for himself. Does that make sense? And that's very in keeping with their religious worldview. And so they interpreted the flood through that lens. Why did that happen? Well, because the gods don't want to lose their place. Right? Versus our story. Where we have a broken-hearted God that is just giving the people what they want. Okay, you want chaos. I will hand you over to chaos. You tracking? Was that too much of a rabbit trail? Okay. It's fun. It's fun, yeah. I've read way too much about this stuff. Um, so, um, hmm. do you want to start chapter seven? Yeah? Okay. We'll keep going. I'm going to have coffee. <clears throat> it's going to look really weird on YouTube. I'm just going to like disappear. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, that'd be weird. <laughs> I know, right? Just leave me alone. It's like the kids, anyway. I can make joke, uh, jokes about my children like literally all day. It's fun. Um, so I, I went and, and spoke at a uh, a retreat this uh, this past weekend. Um, the Chi Alpha up in Lubbock, Texas Tech, was doing a, a spring retreat, and I had the honor of preaching to them over that weekend. Um, but my sons. Uh, so I took my daughter Finnegan with me, and uh, she helped out with childcare there. She got paid for it, like really nice. I'm proud of her. Uh, I was going to charge her room and board, but then I decided not to. Um, <laughs> I'll let her keep the money. Uh, I was like, pay your part of gas, kid. Uh, anyway, um, but uh, my my sons Donald and Henry, the two oldest boys, figured out how to text me from their iPads, and so I I like I got. I got like signal in like this one corner of the camp, right? It's just like, and if I walked by there, my phone would pretty much melt in my pocket because they, they're just sending me nothing but like emojis and just like <laughs> audio messages and like videos of like the, the camera shooting up their nose kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about? The kid angle. They're like, I miss you, dad. And then, so my phone's like, <laughs> anyway, uh, it was cute, but also super annoying. Um, Long story short, don't let your kids have iPads. That's essentially what I've learned. Um, okay, Genesis 7, verse 1, starting. Here we go. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone have seen, I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also, of the birds of the sky, by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. 
For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will not and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all the Lord had commanded him. So this is pretty cool. Noah is called righteous. Um, I, I don't think anyone else in the Bible has been called righteous yet. Anybody? I, I don't remember anybody being called righteous before this, right? So that goes back, why is he righteous? Because he's meticulously obeying the Lord's commands. He's, he's obeying all that the Lord commands him. See that? There's a theme building here, right? So is he the snake crusher? He's obviously fulfilling the role that Adam was supposed to fulfill. He's righteous. He's obeying God, right? He's preserving life. He's created this miniature Eden where all the animals are living together, right? Everything's going to come together. It's going to be great, you know? Think of that uh, crunk from Emperor's New Groove. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's all coming together. <laughs> the best movie ever, right? Um, I do want to note something. God values obedience more than understanding here, okay? We see that obedience is the thing that God keeps on commanding of Noah and asking of Noah, which Noah keeps on fulfilling. But we see this mention of clean animals, what is a clean animal? Right, but we don't know that yet. We, we, like in the narrative, we're like, what's a clean animal? How do I know what's clean? Well, God just tells Noah, right? The, the explanation of what defines clean or unclean actually comes about 400 years later, right? And then, and then he says, like, I'm going to send rain on the earth. What is rain? We haven't seen that yet, right? The closest thing to it is Genesis 2, 5 says, Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Right? What? We don't know what rain is. So where Adam and Eve filled in their knowledge gap by eating fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, we see Noah being obedient when things did not make sense. Right? So God values obedience above understanding. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So some people, yes, you have a question? Why does it say seven? Seven? Yeah. I know. That's weird, isn't it? Because one's missing a mating pair. Right? It's because seven is like that, the number of perfection. It's the holy number. It's the number of God. Right? Just like there's seven days of creation, so there's seven animals. That's supposed to be like the perfect number. All the others are two by two, but, but the clean animals are seven because it's holy and perfect. And the birds. I forgot about the birds. Right? Um, so we can't say it's possible that there was a sacrificial system in place because we see sacrifice being made in Genesis chapter 4, but there's been no explanation or presentation of what was clean or unclean. So Noah just did all of this out of trust and obedience, right? Which is, what's that, uh, there's an old hymn, just trust and obey, just trust and obey, right? Um, I saw something in here that wasn't in my notes, and now I can't remember where it was. Doesn't matter. We'll move on. Okay. Moving on. Okay, this is a big chunk of Scripture here. Uh, we're going to be reading verse 6. It says, Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year, 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all of the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. 
On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed the door behind them. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains were everywhere under the heavens, uh, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts, and every swimming thing that swam, swarms upon the earth, and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the Spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every th living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth one hundred and fifty days. Okay, another moment of bad tourism. Every child's a child story version of this, right? Like we always see this as like rainbows and like there's animals that are smiling as they get on the ark, you know. And like you see Noah and his family like on the, on the bow and they're like, you know, smiling and waving. But like that's not this at all. Like I want to take a moment to humanize this moment, right? We need to like put ourselves in the story. Look at how much text was placed just to this entering the ark and water's coming part. How repetitive it is. It's trying to drive the point home that this is a huge, horrible deal, right? Um... So we have land that has been ruined by violence and bloodshed where force rules the day, right? And then, and then the waters start coming. The waters start coming and the people are running for cover. Just imagine this. Maybe the first few days that it's raining, people aren't freaked out as much. Sure, they're probably like, why is it dripping from the sky, right? But maybe they don't panic that much. But how many days does it rain until they start to panic and start to look for cover? You know? Who knows? How many days did it rain before people started banging on the walls of the ark? How many people remembered, hey, that, that thing over there, maybe that'll save us. Maybe that's where we should go. Maybe they'll let us in. And so they run there with hope and begin to pound on the doors and no one opens. How many days did it rain until people stopped banging on the ark? How many days were they floating on the water before the screams stopped? How many weeks, maybe months, until they stopped hearing the bodies of men, women, children, birds and animals thumping against the sides of the boat? All of Noah's neighbors that he cared about, the families of his daughters-in-law, his whole family, gone. Everything gone. This isn't a happy event with a rainbow in the background. This is churning, storming seas, swallowing up humanity and wiping them all out. 
I mean, could you imagine? So I remember I used to think Noah was the biggest doofus, right? He just survived the flood. God does this amazing miracle, right? It's a miracle so amazing that we're still talking about it today, right? We're thousands and thousands of years later in history, and we still remember him because of his obedience and how amazing this miracle was. And then he gets off the ark, and the first thing he does is make wine and get drunk. I was like, gosh, what a fool. But then I thought, how long did he have to hear his neighbors scream? And in order to be obedient to God, do nothing. How many times do you think he looked out that window that was in the ark and saw somebody he knew? This is horrible. So for me, this only reinforces the greatness of Noah's obedience, right? Two more times now in this passage, we read about Noah's obedience. It's mentioned in verse 9 and verse 16, right? And it's his obedience to God that is his path to salvation, even at great personal cost, even at emotional traumatic levels he remained obedient to God and because of that his family was saved and he himself was saved right this whole passage that we just read like the second half of of the chapter or I guess more than half it's like the two-thirds of the chapter is all about what he had to do It's all about the things that he had to carry out and is repetitive because it wants to drive home the point that he was obedient. He did all the things that the Lord commanded him. And that's why he was allowed on that ark. And that's why no one else was. You see that? So at this point in the story, um, and we'll we'll probably end it here because we'll just end on a depressing note. At this point in the story now, the floods have come. Everyone is dead. It's raining for 40 days, and the water will remain on the earth for 150 days before it begins to recede. So we're going to leave with Noah, surrounded by dead floating carcasses of his friends, families, and neighbors, livestock, animals, floating on waters, stormy seas. And then we'll pick up next week and see if it gets better. <laughs>